Hi, I'm Adam Shepherd. And I'm Jane McCallion. And you're listening to the IT Pro Podcast. The cloud has gone from being a place where you store and share documents to being at the core of productivity and cross-team collaboration to, thanks to the pandemic, underpinning almost every element of our lives, whether that's working or keeping in contact with friends and family. As things shift yet again, we ask, what's next for the cloud? Has it reached its ultimate form, or are there more new phases to come? And if so, what will they look like? We're joined this week by Tim Hancock, Head of Cloud and Managed Service at UK tech consultancy BJSS, to discuss what the next wave of cloud has to offer. Tim, thanks for joining us. Good morning. Thanks for the uh, invite. So Tim, before we start looking at the future of cloud, it's worth taking a second to talk about the present. We hear a lot of talk about cloud adoption, digital transformation, but in your experience, how mature are UK organisations in terms of their cloud posture? I I think organisations are maturing quite quickly, actually. Um, we're seeing far more adoption by larger enterprises. It, it was probably the uh, realm of the digital natives uh, a few years ago, but we're starting to see enterprises embrace cloud a lot more. Um, the cloud adoption framework, as produced by a number of the large uh, hyperscale vendors, is becoming the norm in terms of how organizations start to adopt cloud. So due to the pandemic, uh, a large portion of the cloud investment that we've seen over the last kind of year or so has been around VDI, desktop as a service, and SaaS tooling uh, in order to allow people to work from home more efficiently. Now, will organizations continue to build on this investment with additional uh, cloud capabilities, or will other IT issues come back into play now that remote working is less kind of business critical? I, th I still think we'll see the investment into remote working. I mean, I mean, even at BGSS, we've adopted what's called hybrid working to give people the freedom to work from home, to work from client side, to work to work from office, and and that that really depends on um, client led uh, conversations. So if the client wants us to be on site, then that's fine. If they want us to work remotely using WVD, for example, we'll certainly we, we could accommodate that. So I think that will be a, a continued form of investment because people are used to working in a hybrid way now. So why would they go back to the old ways of working? Mm. But will organizations need to continue putting money into this, if you like, beyond the kind of investments that they've already made? I mean, obviously, you have kind of rolling subscription costs for anything that's uh, that's kind of charged in, in that model. But in terms of major investment and deployment projects, let's say, for kind of cloud technologies. Is there, are there still bridges to cross in that regard or have most organizations kind of got up to speed with remote working? We're still seeing uh, heavy investment and projects uh, trying to figure out the best form of remote working, especially using things like virtual desktops. So we don't see the pace of that slowing down. And the, the trick is for that is things like integration into other systems. So those are the kind of things we're starting to see more and more coming through. Hmm. So more about refinement than about uh, addition, let's say. Yes, I, I would agree. Yeah. For, say, smaller businesses and startups, does this introduce an additional layer of uh, complexity and cost. Obviously, at the beginning of the pandemic, everybody you know, there was no choice. Everybody just had to make a massive outlay if you wanted to carry on doing business, really, and you had to invest in cloud, and that was the end of that. Um, you know, when you think about smaller businesses, yes, you know, for some elements of the cloud, they were sort of at the vanguard. But to me, it seems that all this kind of new, I want to say kit, but it's somebody else's kit, you know, as the cloud is, um, could present an additional um, kind of cost hurdle to these smaller businesses running on much lower margins. Is that fair or am I misinterpreting what's going on? I think smaller businesses are probably a little bit more agile in terms of their adoption of cloud. They haven't got legacy systems uh, to consider. Uh, and we've certainly seen it with uh, mm -hmm. organisations that are smaller who have moved to the cloud, especially at the start of the pandemic, fully embraced it. Uh, and it's made a big difference to their ways of working and their ability to interact with clients. So uh, despite the fact, because 
you know, the cloud was always seemed like one of those ways to make life cheaper. And despite the fact that there's now, say, um, a bigger investment, you have to put money into you know, some kind of video conferencing. That's like a non-negotiable now, whether that is Zoom or you know, it comes as part of Hangouts or Teams, if you've got perhaps a little bit more budget, um, you, know, you, you have to invest in collaboration software. You have to invest in all this kind of thing. Um, it's not an insurmountable issue, even if it is like a little bit more of a chunky investment. Yeah, I think I think integration into um, uh, existing systems is probably more of a challenge and more of a cost challenge. Um, but for smaller organisations mm-hmm. that that we deal with, they they seem to have embraced working collaboratively in the cloud from the offset. So I, I don't see that as a major hurdle for uh, smaller, more agile organisations. It's it's probably more of a a challenge for larger established organisations who have integration challenges that uh, the smaller organisations don't have. What do some of these integration problems or or challenges look like then from what you've seen, say, with any examples? Well, 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 many would be scale. Um, So obviously being able to scale across thousands and thousands of users is, is often a challenge. Things like security. Um, that's that's uh, another mm-hmm. challenge that we start to see. Uh, and then also, how do you actually control things from a central uh, position? Um, so organizations are often, you know, struggle to actually have any kind of operational capability, especially around uh, cloud services. And this would form another part of that mm-hmm. challenge from an operational perspective. And you did mention at the top, you know, hybrid working has become the buzzword. It's gone kind of from... You know, within the IT community, you know, to something I'm reading daily about on the BBC and Twitter and you know everywhere, we're all talking about it. Does that produce its own challenges in some ways? Uh, that we've gone from being fully or mostly office for many businesses to entirely remote, and then we are heading towards this position where we have to balance both of those at the same time. Um, is that I guess a, a new challenge that's going to need to be um, to be dealt with as well. And and what does that look like? I think so. I mean, we, we've we've already tried um, the uh, position where we have people on Zoom or Teams, people in an office, people remotely gathered together, and that in itself, the human interaction has been it's been quite challenging. If you're all on a, a collaboration mm-hmm. event, it, it's quite easy. If you're all in the office, it's quite easy. But that, the whole hybrid challenge, I think, is gonna is gonna be quite a tricky thing to navigate. Uh, and we've certainly seen it so far. And it, you know, who speaks next, for example, is a is a typical thing that we start to see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, that's that's something that we've dealt with a lot on this uh, very podcast. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, with many thanks to our um, editors, because otherwise, I, I, you know, our listeners would get far more of a um, an insight into just how <laughs> muddled we were, especially before we had video as well. <laughs> mm. I think I think one of the things that we have seen, especially in in BGSS, is productivity has risen dramatically. So you know, when we look at our past performance over the month, we've probably seen a twenty twenty five percent increase in productivity from the kind of work we do, which mm. is an incredible, you know, um, bonus. And, and if, if you could, I think the challenge is going to be, how do you maintain that and keep the the organisation, our our senior leadership team, satisfied with the levels of productivity that have been uh, uh, achieved under, under the pandemic rules? Yeah, and, you know, kind of, as you say, under the pandemic rules, which extends not just to working life, but to home life as well. So I think it will be an interesting question as the rest of life tends to you know, kind of go back a bit more to normal and perhaps people will stop there. The figure I saw earlier today was about you know, 30% extra hours extending people's day because there's mm. now else to do. Yeah. Now that we can go down the pub, <laughs> or just... Uh, WFH become WFP, work from pub, uh, <laughs> or other public location. Um, I'd be interested to see, you know, as, as time moves on, whether or not those lifting of restrictions have an impact on productivity. Yeah, I, I, I also wonder about problem solving as well. I, I mean, you know, we generally will solve problems a lot quicker, I think, when we're all co-located. Um, and mm. the work from pub kind of thing actually starts to factor in sometimes when you can't resolve a problem over a a video 
sometimes to go and have that more human centered conversation around a more social environment often resolves problems that have been bubbling away for quite a while. So we've spoken a lot about SaaS and uh, hybrid working, but let's turn now to the the future of cloud because for a long time, kind of remote working and hybrid working was very much the kind of the next frontier for cloud technologies and and cloud services. But now that that's kind of very much established as the norm going forward. Are we still going to see new usage and deployment models being developed? Or is the next phase of cloud merely going to be kind of bedding down and establishing these kind of existing models? I think um, we're starting to see more demand for things like multi-cloud, for example. I think in the past, we've often seen a single vendor chosen. Um, but most of the bids we're working on today call for a multi-cloud approach. And I, I certainly see, you know, that's been a, a kind of theme that we've seen bubbling through the past few years, but it's starting to become a, an absolute reality. And that 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 in itself drives uh, different skill sets, different operational demands, et cetera. Um, so we're starting to see that that's, that's one area that we're starting to see change. We've always had a lens on things like security and cost, but that is being intensified as more and more workloads move to the cloud. And I think the third thing that we're starting to see coming through is the question around sustainability. Um, and we're starting to see clients ask, ask us around the our view on sustainability as we're moving more and more workloads into the cloud and out of on-premise data centers. So I certainly see that as that third kind of um, um, area where clients are starting to have a, a focused interest. And um, you know, has the experience of the pandemic kind of prepared businesses more for you know, this kind of next phase of cloud? Or are these different problems here to an extent from your answer, what I'm, well, your previous answer rather, what I'm hearing is that, you know, kind of skills might be a problem, specialization might be a problem, rather than, you know, which the groundwork that's been laid over the past 18 months isn't necessarily going to help with. Uh no, I, I I think the um, the acceleration of deployment is has increased. I think that's certainly something mm -hmm. we've seen in the past, uh, let's say, six to nine months. The amount of of asks and desires for organisations to move quicker to the cloud, we've started to see that. But at the same time, that in, you know, it, it it you can only move at the pace that your people can move with you as well. So that in itself causes, mm -hmm. a, causes a, a big challenge. And we're, we're starting to see organizations saying to us, look, you know, we know that you've got some great patterns. Can you share that with us and help us co-create with you? So that's the kind of, that, that theme started to come through. And as, a, as an organization that's always worked in an open source world, it's uh, something that we embrace. Because of course, that's another one of the big things that we've seen during this pandemic, not just collaboration within businesses, but collaboration between businesses as well. There's been a lot mm -hmm. of kind of knowledge sharing and in some cases, pooling of resources to create more kind of partnership led approaches. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it's, um, it, it's, it's interesting because a lot of the large government departments ask when we come to respond to certain bids, they ask for that ecosystem to be almost pre-prepared. And I think I think for organisations, especially UK UK organisations that want to compete for the a bigger slice of the cloud pie, I think it's a really positive thing. And we actively encourage uh, working with um, organisations of a similar size or smaller who can bring niche skills into into the work we do for for larger clients. So, in terms of the multi cloud piece that you mentioned earlier, obviously multi cloud has been a trend for a number of years now kind of evolving out of the old hybrid cloud model where is multi-cloud going kind of in the next year or so because the the basic principles of multi-cloud are now pretty firmly established i would say within organizations as you mentioned organizations kind of know what they're doing when it comes to multi-cloud now or what they want to do um 
and now it seems that multi-cloud is developing into more of a more of a kind of specialization where companies are kind of fine tuning which kind of specific cloud capabilities and cloud environments they want to you know integrate into their estate in order to accomplish their specific goals what's the kind of the roadmap from here for organizations that have started that process I think um, it, it it tends to be workload specific at the moment. So we'll see mm. a cloud for a workload almost uh, kind of a, a theme coming through. Um, we we're, we're also seeing obviously from uh, as as a as a delivery organisation, the hearts and minds of of the decision makers has been it, it, the battle is intense with the with the hyperscale providers at currently at the moment. I think organizations are starting to take a slight step back to say, you know, what we're probably best off doing is having a, a multi-cloud strategy to avoid a bit of lock-in. Um, but at the same time, you know, there will be workload-specific instances where one cloud may, may, may be a better, better fit than another. So with that in mind, how ready are companies to take advantage of this new model? Is there anything that they need to uh, bear in mind or any preparations that they need to take if they want to start using this kind of workload focused uh, operational model? Yeah, I think I think there's probably two, two, well, three key areas, I would say. So obviously people skills. So sometimes it's a challenge getting the subject matter expertise in one cloud, let alone two or three. So the whole upskilling mm. of people is, is a challenge. Then, of course, there's the operational side of, of that. So it's almost building in one cloud environment, then passing it over to your operational team is a challenge. Building in two or three and handing over that to your operational team is, is, is a challenge. And then, of course, you've got the whole layer of governance attached to that as well. So you've got to be really, you know, think through your governance model in order to really take advantage of, of, of what each of the cloud vendors can potentially offer. So I'd say those those are the kind of three areas that I would say um, need to need to be considered. Well, unfortunately, that's not all we have time for this week. But thank you once again to Tim Hancock from BJSS for joining us. You can find links to all of the topics we've spoken about today in the show notes and even more on our website, www.itpro.co.uk. You can also follow us on Twitter, where we are at ITPro, as well as Facebook, LinkedIn, and now Instagram as well. Don't forget to subscribe to the IT Pro podcast wherever you find your podcast to never miss an episode. And we'll be back next week with even more analysis from the world of IT. But until then, goodbye. Bye. The IT Pro podcast is brought to you by the Dennis Podcast Network.